So today's lecture is just drugs, drugs, drugs. We're going to talk about all the different kinds of drugs, <laughs> ways of extracting them, cleaning them up, and so on, and some really interesting techniques that you'll find. Um, I know that y'all did recrystallizations in organic, right? But did you ever do salting, salting out? Did you salt anything out? Okay, so that's a new technique you'll learn about today. So let's, let's dive in. Um, but let's begin with a little bit of uh, review of organic about the different kinds of isomers and, and to think about how the legal system has had to deal with this. You know, when you're trying to name compounds and you've got isomers, you've got to be specific, like cis and trans and so on. Well, then you get into chirality. And so you've got to make the law vague enough that it captures all of the the controlled substance isomers, but not so vague that it catches cold medicine and other things. And so that's a real tricky thing. What are y'all laughing about? No, there was something alarm or something going off. Oh really? <laughs> not my phone. Okay, stopped. maybe it stopped. Okay, good. Yeah. And so then, you know, just as a review, we've got constitutional isomers, which are just different structures. Then you have stereo isomers and things that rotate plane polarized light, they have chiral centers and so on. And so if you think about uh, ephedrine, the cold medicine, it has two chiral centers in it. And so you can go in and you can see when you make methamphetamine, you're going to end up with different chiral centers. And so remember your organic priority. You start with this chiral center and I mean, you put the hydrogen in the back or the, the, the lowest priority in the back and then you work your way with, with the mass of the attached atom. And so, you're looking at this. This is a, a, um, a nitrogen, which is heavier than the hydrogen. Okay, here's a carbon. I mean, nitrogen is heavier than the carbon. And then here's a carbon, and it's got these attached groups. So it's the next priority. And then this is the smallest one. So it's the third priority. And since this goes clockwise, that's to the right. That's rex. And then this one goes counterclockwise. That's to the left, which left pe left-handed people are are sinister. So, <laughs> so that's where you get the S. And so you have two different ways that this would rotate plane polarized light. And so if you're specifically focused on one particular chiral form of the molecule, then there's going to be a loophole in the law. And so that's really the main point of this, is that you've got to take into account all of the different ways to make this molecule, and you've got to write the law to, to capture those. And so you'll say things like, this drug and its analogs. And here's uh, the chirality of ephedrine. It's got two chiral centers, and so you can have RR, SS, RS, and SR forms. And that makes it really hard to do synthesis if you're trying to do a, a stereoselective isolation or a stereoselective synthetic technique. You really need to start with a lot of these are they're natural products. So you start with the chiral form that you want, and then you do your synthesis. Um, of course, the clandestine drug labs are not that sophisticated, so let's look at, at the process of making meth. So this is a video that's uh, pretty interesting, and we'll walk through, I'll kind of narrate some of the things that are happening in this video. There's a few steps missing so that you can't make it at home. <laughs> so. In all actuality, it's breaking bad. I haven't watched it that much. Oh. The reason I haven't watched it is I have, it just bothers me to have um, anti-heroes. You know, where you're cheering, with the per cheering for the person who's doing bad, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so that, that movie just, in, in a little bit, you know, inside, I just felt bothered by it, the yeah. whole premise. And so I have a difficult time with movies that have anti-heroes in them. Uh, so it's just a personal issue. By the end, you're not rooting for him anymore. Okay, that helps. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Oh, this is the world too funny. What's that? Thank you, FBI agents. All right. All right, let's try to get some sound here. Ah, oh, there we go. That's nice. Meth has been around as a street drug since the 50s, but only in limited amounts. Ephedrine, the basic ingredient for making meth, was an obscure chemical used in farm feed. Biker groups in the western U.S. used farm ephedrine to make meth. They called it crank because it would hide the drug in the crankcases of their motorcycles. But then something happened. 
that cause a backstreet revolution. So when you'll hear some of the synthetic techniques called the Nazi technique, and it was associated with a biker group that was white supremacist, and so it was biker meth and the Nazi synthesis method were connected. And so that was the old way to synthesize it. Then you have um, some little more modern ways of doing it now that we have lithium ion batteries. And so the lithium in, in alkaline batteries is used as a reducing agent. And so that's, you'll see that, and that's a, that's a more modern way of synthesizing it. In the 1980s, common cold medicine containing ephedrine and its cousin, pseudoephedrine, were increasingly popular. The medications dried up sinuses and provided a jolt of energy. And various brands filled pharmacy shelves. Before long, drug dealers found a way to transform the medicine into meth. Police in small towns from California to the Carolinas began confronting a new and dangerous plague, meth labs. So you can see that it's a, you can make it just about anywhere. In the 90s, it seemed like meth was being cooked up everywhere. In motel rooms, garages, the house next door. In two years, more than 35,000 meth labs were busted in the United States. That right there is a HCL generator. And so we'll see that later. So the final step is, is to precipitate out the methamphetamine and you have it dissolved in an aqueous, let's see, you have it dissolved in an organic layer, and then you're going to make the, the hydrochloride salt. And so you're going to protonate the base and have the chloride counter ion, and that's an ionic substance and not soluble in organic solution. And so you just bubble HCl gas in there, and the crystals form, very pure. So that's called salting it out. And all you need is some container with a hose on it to generate the HCL. And we'll talk about the reaction that takes place. We're working today with uh, 30 milligram tablets. Lieutenant Jason Gates of the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office led the local charge to shut the labs down. Yeah, this is the, this is the stuff that holds the pill together. And he's become an expert in the very thing he's trying to stop. Yeah, no. yeah, Cooking out meth. He's agreed to show us how easy it is to cook meth while leaving out key steps to prevent copycatters from trying it at home. The goal of this process is to extract the pure pseudoephedrine from cold tablet. That yellow bottle is heat. You can see it at AutoZone. It's pure uh, methanol. And so it's a, a gasoline additive that holds onto water. So if you've got moisture in your lines, you can put methanol in there and it, it helps clear the water out of your gas tank and out of the gas lines. So it's just another commercial product that is a source for methanol, pretty pure methanol. So you've got methanol available. You saw the, um, the coffee grinder. So again, all of this stuff is, there's no possession charge for holding all of that stuff, but having all of those things in one place, you know, it's a, you know, it's a clandestine drug lab. The tools used are crude and dangerous. Methyl alcohol from gasoline additives, ether from spray cans, lithium from batteries. What I think is crazy is this. This is the lithium from the Energizer batteries. This is one of the reasons meth has spread so quickly. The ingredients for making it are legal, inexpensive, and easily available. If you can make chocolate chip cookies, then you can cook methamphetamine. A lot of these folks have no chemistry background at all. They're just mixing A and B together like they'd be mixing milk and eggs. And they don't know, they don't even know what it's gonna do. The preparation is complete. The pseudoephedrine has been taken from the pill. This is pseudoephedrine. Now the real cooking can begin. Meth may be easy to make, but it can just as easily. You may want to close your eyes, your there's face. some burn. Cases here. In the past several years, emergency rooms and burn units have reported alarming increases it's from in the organic visits, solvents. Many due to lab fumes and explosions. Unlike most meth producers, Jason Gate and his team take heavy precautions. <laughs> <laughs> so they are breaking bad, like you said. <laughs> Let me back up a little bit. So they are actually cooking meth right now. See, that's the agricultural anhydrous ammonia. So that's they're getting the ammonia gas to come in. So you can see that it's 
see even our camera has to be that behind the blind because it's so toxic. The drug cocktail That's bubbles nasty. with poisonous fumes. Hydrogen chloride gas spews from the mixture, capable of burning skin, eyes, and lungs. And ammonia, a chemical used by farmers to fertilize their fields, is a key catalyst. It's a risky lab lesson. That's the liquid liquid outcome. extraction he's doing. It's seasoning, not the sodium, now dissolving into the ether layer. The ether layer. Make it make the methamphetamine back into a usable form. That's the HCL generator. So they had the ether layer, they bubble in HCL, and the crystals pop out. Then they filter. The new man made molecule closely resembles the dopamine molecule naturally produced by the brain. Look at that, that makes my head hurt. Those CH2s. <laughs> it's sending out more dopamine. I can see the methamphetamine floating around in the solution now. We're going to filter off the ether, we'll have pure uh, methamphetamine. Using items that could be purchased at neighborhood stores, the team has manufactured meth in under an hour. This is actually a significant quantity. I mean, this is enough to uh, support a drug habit for uh, a week or more for one person. Uh, just this? Yeah, just this little tiny bit. What's that worth? Just that little bit. This probably about three hundred dollars worth of meth, right? Just in this. Three hundred bucks in an hour. Meth is Minus so expensive. Minus expensive. <laughs> growth seems almost impossible to stop. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's when you know students said when I was an advisor for the pre med area they they were like. I would say, why do you want to be a doctor? Because I'm telling them what to what to take. You know, you got to have calculus. And you, Chem one, and get out, and they're like, "Oh, I don't like science." <laughs> like, why do you want to be a doctor? Yeah. Yeah. They're like, because well, doctors make a lot of money. I was like, "There's a lot faster ways to make money <laughs> than ten years of schooling." So, and let me cost you just going for the money. is Probably not the best plan. <laughs> I mean, money's nice, but I mean, like, like I said, three hundred dollars an hour. <laughs> that's not cool. And so then, that's, so that's methamphetamine. Uh, these are the. This is, this is uh, ephedrine. You just re you can replace that OH group there with the with the hydrogen, and, and you've got methamphetamine. Now let's look at some of the other plant extracts. Uh, this is all of the opiates. So we're talking about being in an opioid crisis. This is the poppy seed pod, and you'll see poppies growing occasionally. I mean, around here you'll see these bright red flowers, and sure enough, they'll produce a seed pod. And you cut that open, and you see the poppy seeds, all those little black seeds inside. It looks like um, you open it up, it looks like the center of a poppy seed kolache, which is one of my favorites. <laughs> um, but if you cut that seed pod, that milky substance, the sap or whatever, that's called latex. So the latex comes out and that latex heck, is 10% morphine. So that's pretty strong. And in fact, the old days, the opium dens and so on would just be this extract and they would smoke it. And that, that morphine would go into the body through the lungs. Once again, the lungs are very... Uh, um, sensitive organ, but also they transport organic molecules into the drug, drugs uh, into the bloodstream, and you get high off of it. Um, but the uh, morphine, if you were to eat that latex, your body only absorbs about half of it in the uh, with ingestion. So the, we call that the F oral, the the dose, the oral dose, the effective dose is about half of what goes in. So 50 percent what they call first pass metabolism. So since it's in your gastrointestinal tract, it's already on the path to elimination. And so that going back to our ADME, that metabolism step, if you ingest it, you need to know what the F oral is. That F stands for first pass metabolism. So if that's a, like for, for morphine, if that's 50%, that means you have to give twice as much as what you want to impact the patient, and it's very wasteful. So uh, that's why they don't give typically morphine orally. You know, they do it through injections or IV. Mostly, it's still used for hospice care, and so it is a very effective pain reliever. But again, it's not effective orally because you just pass half of it. Uh, but it also has all these other substances that we've extracted and we've used because they have slightly different properties. We have codeine, which we use in, in cough syrups and other, other formulations. And then we've got all of these minor components, 
aparabidine and thebane and so on. Now, uh, you can get about seven kilograms of raw opium, that, that latex, per thousand square feet of poppy fields. And so this is a cash crop for uh, a lot of the places around India, Pakistan, and so on, uh, and, and Afghanistan. So here's a video of the farming process. We probably won't watch the whole thing, but I just want to show you how big of an operation it is. <coughs> Opium is well known all over the world as a source of narcotic drugs like heroin and morphine. Apart from the narcotic drugs, opium products like morphine and codeine are used in various medicines, analgesics, cup syrups, etc. In traditional Indian medicine also, opium is used in some Ayurvedic medicine. Mansour district of state Madhya Pradesh is famous for the cultivation of opium. Department of Narcotics allows license to farmers to cultivate poppy plants and to produce opium for government. Seeds of poppy, locally known as khaskhas, are sold in the month of November. By February, the poppy plants are fruited enough to yield opium. At this time, farmers do rituals and pray for the good yield, and then collection of opium starts. Two special handmade instruments are used for opium collection, Nakhi and Sarapla. Nakhi is a claw-like instrument made of three to four pointed blades tied together in such a way that only a sharp point of blade is left bare for incising the poppy. Taking incision over the poppy. So these little blades, they scratch the surface. It's a technique. I mean, this is all hand done. So you've got... I don't know, hundreds, maybe thousands of people walking through the fields, scratching the poppy seeds. The latex comes out and turns black and then they scrape that off. And they, they weigh the product because they know that diverted opium is the source of all of the clandestine drug trade. So this is, um, like he said, it's uh, governed by the Department of Interior in India. And so they have a you know national interest in not having their this product go into the, the illicit drug trade, but to be used for you know, pharmaceutical formulations. So you can kind of see they score that pod, the latex comes out, it ages a little bit, they scrape it off and collect it, and, and, they're, and it's weighed. <clears throat> so here are the opiates with, like I said, 10% of it is morphine. And so then when you start with morphine, uh, you can acetylate it. So you guys know what acetic acid is. You make an ester out of, out of this OH group. So you have this, if you look at the molecule and you orient it this way, you see where that, that bridge with the base on it is? It's coming out towards us. So there's a little bridge ring coming across here. If you put that on the bottom or on, on the right hand side, the, the, put it on the bottom like this, uh, you see the three position is at the top and the six position is at the bottom. So the six position is closest to that base bridge. Everybody see that? Okay. The three position will, will acetylate first and then the six position will acetylate second. So you basically cook this with, um, with acetic anhydride. So it's, it's two acetic acid groups joined together uh, with the loss of water, so the anhydride. So you've dried it out and the, the acetic acid has now bonded together, so you have acetic anhydride, and that will react with morphine to make heroin. So when you acetylate both places, you see now you have these ester groups here. So that's diacetylmorphine. So that's the technical name for heroin because you've acetylated both positions, both of those OHs. If you'll notice, the other kinds of molecules are still the morphine structure, that's why they're called opiates, but they just have different functional groups here. Like codeine, this is not an acetyl group. If you look at that, that's, that's a methoxy. And thebane is dimethoxy morphine. So codeine is 3-methoxy morphine, thebane is dimethoxy morphine. And so those are actually extracted from the plant. We don't, you don't want to put a methoxy groups on them. So 
but they're just you can do different stuff with those functional groups and you get the different opiates okay now but the three the three group is more reactive and so it's the first to acetylate but it's also the first to deacetylate and so you can lose that group and you end up with six monoacetylmorphine six man so let's look at the next slide it's got a little more detail on this and so if you reflux this with acetic anhydride, you can see acetic anhydride under the arrow there. You make three acetyl, monoacetylmorphine first. So you put the acetyl group on the, on the three position first, and then you make the diacetylmorphine, which is heroin, typically formed in 50% yield. And then as this ages, or if it's overcooked, then you get deacetylation at the three position and you end up with six man. This is an important thing because the ratio of uh, morphine or heroin to uh, six mam tells you kind of how old it is. So if it's been sitting around a long time, it'll spontaneously deacetylate and the, it'll get it'll grow in its concentration of six mam. So this has been an indicator of the age of the morphine or if it's been overcooked. And so it's a it's a forensically important um, distinction: the six mam versus the diacetylmorphine. Now, this, is, uh, this synthesis is a little more technical than the, the synthesis of, uh, of methamphetamine. And so this is not typically done in clandestine drug labs. So this would be something that's produced on an industrial scale uh, by um, facilities where the officials are looking the other way. Okay, and then it's shipped into the U.S. Uh, typically, it's shipped in by mules. Have you heard of mules? So these are people that have ingested encapsulated heroin um, and you can see it right here so this is an x-ray of a mule and look at that little capsule right there there's a bunch in here but I've shown some of the <clears throat> ones that are very obvious to see so this person has I mean many many times lethal dose of opiates in their inside their GI tract and so that's uh, so they go through the border crossings, you know, their paperwork's fine and everything, they come in, and then they go someplace where they're supposed to meet the person, they take a laxative, they poop all of these balloons of drug out and get their money and go on their way. And then they take that and, I guess, clean it up, I'd hope, and then sell it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's really disgusting. But these are the kinds of things that people are willing to do to get the money from the drug trade. So, yeah. Pretty shocking. Um, if you want, on, you, when you're looking on your own, uh, you can look at that timeline for the different um, heroin timeline, and, and it's it's pretty. It's got a long and storage history. Let's look at some of the cleanup techniques that they use. And so, if you have this um, <clears throat> heroin or even uh, codeine in a cough syrup or uh, cough medicine like Tylenol three, it's got codeine in it. Uh, you know, this is a, a easy technique that people use, and I've, I've marked out the video, and I'm actually happy that that video is not working, because that was just some high school kid with a video of him extracting codeine from Tylenol 3, like in his kitchen. Like, mom and dad don't know that he's putting this video up there. You never see his face, but uh, the solubility, Tylenol is damaging to the liver, okay? And codeine is what he's after, and so he does a cold filtration, so he puts... Uh, he like crushes up the tablets, puts it in water, sets it in the fridge, and the the, uh, the uh, Tylenol is is not dissolved at that cold temperature, but the codeine is, and so then he filters it out, and so he just does a cold filtration, and he's got uh, a concentrated codeine, and it's also not going to be that pure of a separation, so he is going to be harming his liver over time. But I went to look at it and it says, due to our YouTube policies, this video has been restricted. And I was like, yes, finally something that is legitimate that should be restricted has been restricted. <laughs> at least there's one, right? And so, uh, and so you dissolve this uh, base HCL, so the heroin HCL, in, in water because it's ionized, so it's soluble in water. Then you can, you can precipitate or, or you can uh, filter out all of the other excipients, so the things like the starch binder and and the tablet coating and everything like that that's not soluble in water, uh, you filter that out. And so then you have the, the HCL form of the base, the soluble base in water. And what are you going to do to clean that up? 
because it's also got other water soluble things that you want to separate. So you change the pH and you take that proton off and now it's neutral and put it in contact with an organic layer. So now you have your, your deprotonated heroin molecule or morphine molecule or codeine molecule. You've deprotonated it, it's organic soluble, so it goes into a chloroform layer. And then you can throw away the aqueous layer and get rid of all of the aqueous components that you don't want. So you've, you've separated solids that are not water soluble. You've, protonated, you've deprotonated your base and made it organic soluble. And so all the water soluble stuff you throw away. And now you have the molecule in an organic layer. You can salt that out with HCl. So you bubble hydrochloride gas in, into the chloroform layer and it's going to protonate the base, which is your drug, and have a CL counter ion and you're going to see crystals grow. Okay. We do the same kind of thing, or it says also you could evaporate, but um, we, the same thing goes for cocaine cleanup. So this has that tropane ring which has four chiral centers on it. So again, trying to figure out the chirality of this molecule would be a beast. Okay. Uh, you have all of these other kinds of analogs, and so here you would have to say uh, cocaine and its analogs would be restricted. So that would get pseudoalkane, alkane, pseudococaine, all of these different forms with the different um, functional groups on here and different um, chiral centers. Sometimes the penalties depend upon purity, and so they'll use GCMS to get all of these other kinds of things. So let's look at cocaine extraction. So we take the cocoa leaves and we crush them up, chop them, dry them, and we can, ex there's really two pathways that we could take. So either one of these sides of this extraction would work. Um, the one on the right, I think is a little more crude. So let's do that one first. You could e extract the, the cocaine in its salted form, its protonated form with sulfuric acid. So you've protonated it, it's soluble in water. And so it's going to be in the aqueous solution with the uh, sulfuric acid. You can put that in contact with an organic layer and all of the molecules that came out of that plant that are, that are not bases, you could get over to the organic layer and throw it away. So you could clean it up by getting rid of all of those things that are, that are not bases. And then you adjust to high pH. I mean, no, you... you uh, yeah, so you discard the organic layer, and then you make it base. It's aqueous with, with a low pH, and then you adjust it to a high pH and deprotonate it and put it in to another... Oh, no, you've got it in the aqueous phase, and so you, you uh, deprotonate it, and it's not soluble in water. So when you deprotonate the, the cocaine in an aqueous environment, you don't need an organic layer. It will grow crystals. And so you'll have the cocaine crystals come right out of the water layer when you deprotonate it. So you make it basic and it starts to crash out. Okay. <clears throat> and then you have this filter, this case that you can filter. And then you can redissolve it in kerosene, which again, if they're doing that, that's not a very pure organic solvent. It'd be better to steal like a, like a good organic solvent. Gasoline or kerosene is not going to be the nicest thing to, to reprecipitate in. But you, would, you could dissolve that organic base into an organic solution and then salt it out with an HCl generator. Over on the left side, you could extract the organic molecule with an organic solvent and base. So you could make a liquid-liquid extraction and throw away the aqueous layer. And so the molecule is in the, in the, the organic solvent. Then you can put it in contact with an aqueous layer that's acidic, and so it goes into the aqueous layer as the protonated form, and then you can throw away the organic layer. So this sort of, sort of filters the, the aqueous things out first and then the organic things out by moving the, the molecule you want between the two layers using pH. Then you can make that, that aqueous layer basic, and then it would crash out because it's not soluble in water, and then you can filter out the precipitate and then recrystallize in kerosene with an HCl generator. So again, I think the, the left side is a little cleaner because you, you take away the aqueous things first and then you take away the organic things and then you're left with the uh, pure crystals. 
but all of these would end up with this HCL generation, generator step. So these are HCL generators that have been uh, found in clandestine drug labs. I mean, even like a ketchup oh, bottle. What's that? Yeah, I know, exactly. Yeah, I mean, they, this is high tech, so that, that person's, yeah. And so this is for salting bases out of an organic solvent. And you remember Le Chatelier's taxi, so you just take a big old like, chunk of, like the whole can of Morton's table salt and put that in water. And it's a saturated solution of, H, of, of NaCl. So you've got a lot of chloride ions. And then you just put in a few drops of concentrated uh, hydrochloric acid, like muriatic acid, and it's going to generate a lot of HCl gas. So it'll, it'll actually, I don't know how many PSI, but it's, it's a substantial pressure that you get out of it. I mean, you know, I would say in the range of like 20 to 50 PSI. You know, it's not like 200 PSI, but it's, you know, something that, that these little containers could handle. It's going to flow out of there pretty, pretty fast and it's going to bubble in your solution. And that's all you need is that HCl gas to be bubbling in that organic solvent. And it's going to protonate that base and have that chloride counter ion. So you have a, a NH4 or ammonium ion type structure and then the chloride counter ion. And then that's going to be an ionic substance. It's not going to be soluble in organic solvents and it's going to make crystals. And all those other organic molecules that you don't want are going to stay in the organic layer. Now let's go through some of the other kinds of drugs. Some of these, again, are not homemade. They're like lysergic acid, diethylamine, LSD. You have alkaloids like the shrooms. Um, you've got different kinds of funguses. Ergot, mescaline, and psilocin and psilocybin. Uh, the technical names of those in Latin. You have William Z here, and no relation. Okay. So, some do not generate halluc hallucinations, but cause other kinds of out-of-body experiences and messing with the, your tracking of time and your tracking of sight in your brain. And so you might not necessarily see things that aren't there, which would be a huge hallucination, but you might not be able to keep track. You know, your eyes are coordinated to where um, they track together. Well, if you mess with that, then they might not. <laughs> okay, and if your you're messaging in your brain, your message processing center is messed with, then, then what you see is going to be completely messed up. So, I, I don't know. I can't speak from experience, thank goodness. So... <laughs> But these are some of the phrases that the uh, discoverer of LSD used. He called it a severe crisis, a demonic transformation, and he called the LSD his problem child because he kept using it over and over again. Now, how much is a dose to give you this kind of effect? Well, they used to um, put it on the back of stamps. You know, you lick the stamp, that was enough. Like, that was a dose. And so, that, yeah, so it's not very much. You're not having to take, like, an injection of something. And then you have the non-alkaloids. So the amphetamine family is not a plant extract. Again, they're taking a pharmaceutical and they're changing it. So they're, they're taking this synthetic drug and they're modifying it. It's probably nearly the, the second most abused drug behind cocaine. And so you can see the lab cleanups have really exploded. Uh, then you have other kinds of things like uh, MDMA. These are not, again, not uh, plant extracts. A lot of these are stolen from vet hospitals because, uh, you know, these are powerful anesthetics used for large animals. I mean, if you're going to anesthetize a horse, you're going to need something a little more powerful than, than what we use. And then we have diverted pharmaceuticals. This is the number one cause of death for your age group, 18 to 24. It's overdose on diverted pharmaceuticals because we have so many painkillers out there and students think, oh, I'm going to take those and take the edge off or whatever. Or they're not necessarily um, painkillers, but just anti-anxiety medication. And so in here we have all kinds of things. We have the, the painkillers like uh, oxycodone uh, that also hit that euphoric center in the brain, so similar to, to uh, all of the opiates. But then you get over here to um, 
like diazepam, the Valiums, you know, those, those anti-anxiety drugs will, how to say this in a, in a uh, acceptable way, they will, they will sort of break your, a student described this to me, he said, Dr. Williams, I said, what? He said, I have a problem. Okay, what is it? He said, my give a shit broke. <laughs> Okay, I said, you got to get that fixed. <laughs> now, his wasn't drug-induced. This was senioritis. <laughs> Identify, you know. Uh, but, but that essentially is, you know, it's like, okay, it's cool. You know, whatever. Uh, I did have, I don't know what it was they gave me when I had my wisdom teeth taken out. But they said, take, two, they take these two tablets before you show up, an hour before you show up. And I did not care what they did to my mouth. <laughs> they were hammering my tooth. It was in the jaw. They put a chisel in the back of my mouth and they hit it with a hammer. Yeah, and broke that tooth to pieces and picked out the bits. And I'm watching the whole thing in his glasses. They put up a little barrier here so I couldn't see what they were using, you know, the tools and stuff. But I was watching his little face shield. And I got a front row seat. And it was crazy. And I'm looking at that and I start laughing when they get the chisel out. <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> he said, I'm sorry, you know, you okay? I was like, I'm laughing, you know. He's like, all right, give him some more gas and knock this guy out. So, so yeah, they kept putting me back to sleep, but I kept waking up because I know it was, I appreciated that because I didn't want to, um, you know, give me just enough so that you can do your job. Don't knock me out if you don't need to, you know, because, uh, you know, you can, I, I was afraid of going out and not waking up, you know, people are just that way. And so whenever I kept kind of waking up, I was like, okay, I'm still here. They're doing things. And, you know, it's, so that's, so you could imagine the attractiveness if you, if you, if you've got a stressful life, you know, your home life and work and school and everything's hitting you at once and, and they get into this stuff and then they don't know when to stop and they kill themselves with it. They take too much. And so these overdoses on these drugs are the things that uh, are killing our, our young folks. Now, diverted pharmaceuticals, what do I mean by diverted? Selling on the black market. Okay, so have you heard of the concept of a pill mill? This is a book, it was really a book about uh, Gosnell sort of exposing, uh, he just got, he just got uh, convicted of murder. Uh, he's an abortionist in Philadelphia, but the reason he got caught was because of his pill mill activities. So the um, Drug Enforcement Agency learned that, that this was the source of a lot of the diverted pharmaceuticals and he was writing fake prescriptions to people. So people would go in and buy prescriptions from him and then they would go get them filled at, at uh, pharmacies that were in on it. Okay. So you need a doctor that's in on it, you need a pharmacy that's in on it, and then you need the street people. Yeah. Wasn't there like a few years ago like a really bad time in Florida where like people were just coming in and out of state for like massive bags of like oxys i don't know yeah but i mean it's happening all around we couldn't have this epidemic of o opioid addiction and people just buying thousands of these pills if doctors and pharmacies weren't helping out and so this is a medical ethics issue as well and, and a crime issue because it's lucrative if you look at this the pharmacy is getting 80 bucks a tablet well uh, the street price 80 bucks a tablet for oxycodone so these people are going in and paying cash for a large amount of pills. Uh, so this guy, uh, the DEA agent in Northeast Philly, um, this was from the book, talked about that Gosnell forged prescriptions for over 142,428 tablets. Yeah, that's a lot. Okay, and think about the street price of all of those tablets at their average of about $80 a tablet. So this led to the discovery of Kermit Gosnell's pill mill smurfing scheme. So smurfs are junkies or fake patients that buy dozens of prescriptions. And so this is from, I pulled this from the book. Uh, it's a very interesting book, but it's difficult to read because it's so, so graphic. I mean, it's, it tells, tells everything. On one visit, wrote uh, Susan this set of uh, prescriptions. And so he, she bought these prescriptions. So 60 Oxycontin tabs, 90 Xanax, you know, codeine tablets, uh, 60 tabs of Bactrim, and 10, 60 tabs of Lexapro. 
and he let this other person use 26 different patient names. And so she's buying, you know, all of these prescriptions for all these different patients. And so that gives the pharmacy deniability. She comes in with 60 different prescriptions and gets them filled. You are like, how can she buy that? Well, she's selling them. So she's taking the money that she just got from selling these drugs and going and paying cash to the pharmacy. So the pharmacy has this enormous cash flow, okay? And they've got all these different patient names in their system, so what do they care? I mean, it's ethically wrong, but they can, they can show the books. Here's all my patients, here's all their money. Um, but eventually it just gets too big to be believed and they get caught. But if you think about that, he would sell like 200 prescriptions per night. And the first time you did it, it was $150, but then $20 per prescription after that. So uh, Susan, you know, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 bucks, and she has this, these prescriptions. And then she goes in and has to get those filled at the pharmacy, so she pays quite a bit more. Yeah. So I find it really hard to believe that, uh, like, having all those, like, pills in a bottle, like, that's really hard not to get caught. Yeah, and yeah. I feel like as soon as you read the name of the doctor who prescribed it to you on the pill bottle, yeah. and then that gave it away. Yes, exactly. If people were really looking for it, yeah, yeah. And so that's how the DEA caught them. So they were, they were, you know, these informants and so on. They're like, okay, we found the source. You know, rounding up Susan's and Fiona's, you know, you're... Yeah, you're taking one person off the street that's selling 60 tabs here and 80 tabs there. They want to find the doctor. They want to find the pharmacy. And there was a pharmacy that said, okay, that's enough. We're going to get busted. So they quit filling his prescriptions. And so there were some ethical pharmacies that said, we're not going to do this anymore. We know what's going on. Yeah. But they, the DEA wanted to find out the doctor. Now, I don't know if he was using, I didn't see in the book whether he was using his real name or whatever. You know, so like you look at the bottle... You know, and you know, was it Kermit Gosnell or was it you know I some other? Like, yeah, well, the pharmacy would have to be on in on it. Yeah. Well, also, like if they're out there dealing and they're getting caught dealing, they probably already took it out. Well, that's true too. You're not going to walk around with the bottle. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna be selling bags of individual tabs or whatever. Yeah. So you're gonna throw that stuff away fast. Yeah. Yeah. So that's. Uh, as I was reading that, I was like, wow, this is really great for my forensic chemistry class because I didn't know how a pill mill scheme worked, you know. And so this is, this is what's going on, I guess, on the street, you know, people selling pills to each other. And, and, but you've got to have a pharmacy that's, you know, going against their, uh, the, the radar or the alarms in their head. They're like, man, this is strange. This doctor's, you know, or this person's coming in with five prescriptions. Now you could probably make a case, look, I'm working with the nursing home or whatever, and I'm going down there, you know, passing out. These old people can't come in. You know, you could come up with some stories that the pharmacist is probably like, yeah, I don't know about this. Um, but, you know, maybe they go with it. So that's what's going on. Let's take a quick kahoot on the different drugs. <laughs> I like a little bit of these. How's that? Don't say the pharmacy. <laughs> Yay. Okay. I guess they did. Where does cocaine come from? <clears throat> Coca Cola. <laughs> 
the list. Those numbers. That was a fast one. Where does methamphetamine come from? Hmm. Psilocybin come from? I kind of went through that slide fast, but by elimination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There we go. The shrooms. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> ready? Okay, let's see how we did. <coughs> <laughs> it's too fast. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's a pretty close race, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Runner up. Okay, great job. Okay, so now for some business, I'm gonna um, go through the uh, the one of the things. Which one? 